Jersey TV. Now they finally let me out of LaGuardia uh, after seven hours. Yeah, we were all sitting on the airplane on the tarmac and the captain came on and said, Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we seem to have a little problem with the fuel on the ground uh, coming from the left wing. Uh, we're having the technicians look at it now. We waited 20 minutes. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, this is the old captain speaking from the flight deck. Uh, everybody's going to have to get the hell off this airplane. We're going to need a new airplane. We might be able to fix this one. We'll let you know. But uh, they tried to fix it. And uh, the guy sitting next to me said, Well, you know, better safe than sorry. And I said, I, I don't know. I, I say roll the dice. Let's, let's go. The guy looked at me like I was crazy. So, you know, what? I mean, so, there's a little fuel on the ground coming out of the left wing. I mean, you know, chances are we're going to make it. His expression never changed as he looked at me. Perhaps it is that he values his life here on Earth more than I do. I don't know. I just kind of wanted to get back to the peninsula. So anyway, there was a seven-hour delay. Had to take a different plane. In fact, it was a new plane. This was Spirit Airlines. I mean, a brand new plane. They flew it in from Detroit to LaGuardia with nobody on it. And our flight was the very first passenger flight on this brand new airplane, which is could be a stress in its own right for some people. Like, what? They've never flown this plane before with people on it? No, it's all right. We're going to roll the dice. You roll the dice every time. Well, you roll the dice every time you board a plane or get into your car or wake up. Welcome to MZTV. I'm Martin Zender. The first order of business is to thank everyone who sends me cards, uh, letters, little gifts in the mail. Denise Snyder, I've been remiss in thanking you for your latest package. Those little fruit cups are delicious. Thank you very much. Bob Brayfogel has sent me packages here. Bob Eveland recently. Thank you, Bob. Mark Haukas sends me a nice card. Personal touch. I mean, I can text with these folks, but, you know, they they reach out via mail, via cards, handwriting. It's nice to see that. Uh, Lawrence Schuler And I recently got a nice note from Greg Sobo. There's one thing Greg said that, if you don't mind, Greg, I just like that read this to the folk i always appreciate it when people recognize the, the 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 strain of this work over the years greg says i can easily see how emotionally and physically draining your work in this body can be i do not envy you but i sure as hades respect and thank god for you well thank you greg i appreciate that and um to everyone else who has sent little love packages here whose names i'm not mentioning here but you know who you are and i know who you are thank you for all those who support this work financially thank you this wouldn't be happening without you the interview with my son luke would could not have happened without your financial support and so and your love and your encouragement and your understanding you know of just how difficult uh, this work is it is an amazing thing no matter it, i should say it this way in, in spite of the fact that i've recorded over 2700 videos it's never on autopilot never i'm never confident that any show will be good that i'm still going to have it for the next show each show is a miracle in its own right nothing ever goes perfectly smoothly and as i say i think the most important point here is that it's never automatic it has to be genuine each show has to be genuine very rarely have i had to take a show that i made and trash it before it gets published but i will do it if i feel that i mailed it in or it's just not genuine so Thank all of you for being in this work with me. It would be terrible. I mean, it's hard enough doing it by myself here as I'm in this room by myself staring at a, a camera behind me as a stove and a cupboard. But I feel your presence with me. Don't mean to get Pentecostal here, but it's true. It's the strangest thing. I've met many of you. But even those of you I have not met, thank you for being here, and I, I sense your presence. 
Sounds like you're all dead. I sense their presence in the room. No, it's not that at all. That uh, video Monday with my son, Luke, your response was amazing. I just appreciate how much you appreciated that. I guess I sort of take for granted the relationship I have with all three of my sons. It is genuine. We can talk about anything. We have mutual respect. And I was as surprised as you when you saw that video. I mean, I was surprised a little earlier than you were. But the situation was uh, my son, Luke, is a broadcaster in his own right. Uh, if anyone needs help learning English, he has a wonderful website, Cloud English. The kid is really good at making videos, and he's a great teacher. So if anyone is trying to learn a new language, my son Luke, go to, go to Cloud English. That's him. But he had rented a room in a house a few miles away from his house just to have some place to go and to set up his equipment and to have it all quiet. And I went there to see it. I hadn't seen it yet. And so he said, why don't you make, you can make one of your videos or two of your videos from my studio. That way you don't have to make another one in your car. He knew that I had made one in my car the day before. I said, that'd be great. He goes, do you know what you're going to talk about? I said, I said, no, but if you just give me like five minutes, I'll be able to figure it out. I just need to think about what I'm going to talk about. And he goes, well, if, if you have nothing right now and you're up for it, what would you think about an interview? What would you think about me and you just sitting down and talking about things we disagree with concerning God and the scriptures? And, and I was taken aback. I really was. But how could you, how can a father possibly say no to an offer like that from a son? And I want to tell you that that show developed five minutes, 10 minutes at the most. That show was born only 10 minutes before we turned the camera on. There was no discussion ahead of time of what the topics would be. None. None. And my hands were shaking. I don't know if you could tell, but as I turned on that camera, my hands were shaking. I was a little bit nervous just because of the tension that I knew would be there between my son and I. Um, as you know, as I've popularly said, I have three sons, one of each, uh, referencing the passage from 1 Corinthians, which I read on that show. Paul really breaks down the human race into three categories, Jews, Greeks, and believers. Uh, Jews and the, the cross as the as the litmus point, the, 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 the cross as the fulcrum point around which these groups break off. The cross is foolishness to the Jews. It's a stumbling block because it's too simple. It's too complete. And Paul says to the nations, that is to the Greeks, the cross is stupidity because they can't possibly see the wisdom of God in a crucified man. Paul goes on in 1 Corinthians, yet to those of us who are believing, it's the power of God, and the love of God, the grace of God, the glory of God. And the only thing I knew as we turned on the camera that I was going to have to tell Luke, I said, huh, and I, you heard it. If you haven't heard it, watch Monday's show. I said, I knew that I was going to have to tell him that I have mentioned you in several shows, Luke, and I have categorized you, sorry, son, but uh, as a worldly unbeliever, because the Jew is the religious unbeliever, the Greek is the worldly unbeliever. And the shock of that passage in 1 Corinthians is the realization that there are two groups of unbelievers. Two groups of unbelievers. They are both as unbelieving as an unbeliever. I mean the most subtle and deceptive group, obviously, and the most deceived group, I might say, is the religious unbelievers because they are operating under the guise, in the guise of a legitimate believer using the name of God in Christ. See, my son Luke doesn't do that. He's honest. He's honest about his questions concerning God and the Scriptures. 
And I brought up the fact that I believed, I said, Luke, I've said this on my show, that I believe that you're, you're jettisoning of those godly principles in which you grew up, I should say, the teachings. I believe that happened when you went to college and you studied philosophy for a year. So we had this conversa conversation. It, it was glorious. And I appreciated all your comments about it. I didn't realize how much you would dig that show. I had no idea how it was going to go, and many of you said it was a testament. Among other things, you said it was a testament to the relationship I have with my son, Luke, and yes, that's true, and I just thought of this today. What if I went to Ohio and interviewed my son, Paul, the one who is becoming a pastor in the Christian religion with whom I've had intense backs and forths I will do that I will do that but I have to wait and see how he reacts to the fact that I sent him this book I'm still I haven't given up on him he's in the Christian religion he's in deep he believes all the false teachings of Christianity and I know how dangerous that is and I know in the near future, what that will portend, what that portends and what that will produce. And so I have, while well, being at peace, at the same time, I, living in the relative as I do, I've tried to get the truth to him. And um, this book, by the way, Christianity's Final Solutions, very close to coming. It's obviously a book, but we haven't put it up publicly for sale yet. I had taken 300 of them to the conference, as you know, the last conference in Georgia. Um, I'm the one holding it up because we advertise how to quit church without quitting God. And that book is out of print. So I've had to make some, some corrections to get how to quit church without quitting God back in print before this book is put up for sale. So that's coming very soon. I'm the one holding it up. I, so I apologize to everyone for that. But I had sent my son Paul a private video explaining to him that I wrote about him, not by name, in this book as I compare Christianity to the Third Reich. Yeah. I write about Adolf Eichmann and how he, when he was captured and tried 20 years after the war, he had assumed a different name, went into hiding in Argentina. His excuse was he was the transportation czar in Hitler's Reich, and it was his job to get the Jews to the killing camps. He was very efficient at his job. His defense was, when they took him to trial in Israel, was, a, I never killed anybody. And it's true, he never personally killed anyone, but he was complicit in this grand scheme. And of course, the thrust of this book is that the, the Nazis considered the Jews a problem. In fact, they called it the Jewish problem. My analogy is that the Christian God has a similar problem. It's the unbeliever problem. What do we do with these people that we aren't really worthy of anything? What, what do we do with these troublemakers, these unbelievers, to the, to the Christian religion and the Jews, to Hitler's Reich? Well, Hitler decided, we'll just kill them all. Ah, that's the final solution. The appalling thing is... The Christian God also has a final solution, except it's far, far, far worse than that devised by Heydrich and Himmler and Hitler and Goebbels and Eichmann, and that is, we'll torture them. We'll torture them for eternity. And so I draw that comparison, and I never told my son Paul that I had written about him, but I recently did. And I have not heard from him yet. He's still sitting on that. Uh, this was my last ditch effort. I know the times we're living in, of course. This is my last ditch effort to shock him into a realization of what he's involved in. Eichmann was complicit. They hung Eichmann because of his complicity in the plan. Any Christian, especially the leaders, are complicit in the insane, evil teaching of eternal conscious torment. They are complicit by association in the heralding of the most evil message that has ever gone forth to the human race and has driven billions of people from God over the last 2,000 years. So let's see what 
Let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. I will go, I will fly to Ohio tomorrow to interview Paul for you. I will do that. And of course, Gabe, the believer, I will, I will, as long as I was in Ohio, if I was interviewing Paul, I would take my microphones to Greenwich and interview Gabe. Many of you know Gabe. You met him at uh, one of the conferences. I forget which one it was. Oh, Des Moines, Iowa. What a beautiful believer. All my sons, let me tell you something about, the, just the beliefs aside, my sons, they're, they're characters. They're sterling characters. They, they have married beautiful women, caring women, loving women, and they are the most excellent husbands. And in the case of my son Luke and my son Paul, great fathers, and I couldn't be prouder of them. And for those of you who have raised children, you know how hard it is. And this is the main message here that I want to give you today. It won't take long. I'm already looking at my time, realize I'm halfway through the show, but that's okay. A couple of you said that you envied the, the relationship I have with Luke. <clears throat> I understand that. You know, when you raise your kids, you give it everything. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. When I say works, I mean, after you raise them, you do the best that you can, and then other influences come in. My son Paul was befriended by a high school basketball coach, and that's the one that led him into the Christian cult. What can you do after that? I mean, you after you raise your kids, you can't follow them around. Some parents try to do that, follow their kids around everywhere and micromanage their lives. That's a huge mistake, obviously. You do what you can while they're yours. But I know that some of you have terrible regrets about the way you raised your kids. And I want to give you comfort about that today. Because you are operating at a disadvantage now. And the disadvantage you're operating at is that now you are freed from all the responsibilities you had then. Now you're in a place where, where you can sit back apart from the responsibilities and the worries and the trials and the traumas you personally were going through during those years. And you are looking back under a, a false filter. You're trying to put yourself back in those days when you were raising your kids and you made mistakes. You're trying to put yourself back there with your present mindset, not only with the wisdom you've accrued from that time to this, but your situation is different. Maybe you're retired now. Maybe financially you're better off than you were Maybe your health is in a better place. You're less pressed for time. But I want you to think back of when you were raising your kids. And, of course, we all make mistakes. Nobody does it perfectly. It's on-the-job training. Whether you're a husband or a wife or a father or a mother, you can't prepare for it. You're just thrown into it, and on day one, it's OJT, on-the-job training but I would like you those of you who have regrets and wish you had done differently I will say this that you were under such stresses at the time not only were you trying to raise your kids but you're trying to maintain a relationship with your spouse which is a full-time job on its own and then you had to have an actual job where you made money so that you can support your family and so you were under at that time you forget this I'm here to remind you you were under so many different pressures. Maybe you were sick. Maybe you were ill. Maybe your parents raised you crappy. It could be. Many of you, I know, you had terrible parents. And so don't you think you, you automatically bring that in to your parenting? It's not your fault. It is not your fault how you were raised. And as much as you try to overcome the way you were raised and then and you say to yourself things are going to be different with me starting now starting with this generation i'm going to make changes and you probably did you probably made glorious changes that you're not giving yourself credit for but 
chances are some of that uh, poor upbringing that you were a victim of seeped into your own training of your own kids. So take that, the fact that you inherited your ideas about child rearing from your parents. Take that. I mean, me, I happen to have great parents, so I had so many advantages, but I'm not here to talk about me right now. I'm here to talk about you. Think of the fact that you were raised with terrible parents and you tried to overcome that. And at the same time, you're struggling in your job. You're having financial problems. You might be sick. You're fighting personal issues, issues with your spouse, issues at work, issues with your health, and at the same time trying to raise kids. You're tired. You forget the fatigue you were under when you were raising your kids. You forget the constant state of fatigue. So, And then I haven't even mentioned the fact that you're a son or daughter of Adam, that you have mortality running through your veins. Not even mentioned. I didn't even mention that. That's probably the most important part. So you're dying you're dying, literally, while you're raising your kids. You're a son or a daughter of Adam. You have mortality coursing through your veins. You don't get enough sleep because these are the years where you really need to work to support your family. And you have all these things operating in you to weaken you. You forget how weak you were when you were raising your kids. See, that's the advantage you have now when you look back. But actually, it's not an advantage. It's a disadvantage because now you look back and you go, why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do this? Why didn't I do this? I'll tell you why you didn't. Because of the stresses and the fatigue and the sickness and the, the pressure you were under at that time that you're not under now. And you say to yourself, if I could only go back, if I could only go back and do it again, well, let me tell you something. If you went back to do it again, you would do the same damn thing. Yes, you would. Because it's not like you're going back with the wisdom you've accrued over the years. It's not like you're going back with your current relative state of ease and maybe a little bit of more contentment, more more peace you have now than you had then when you were in the heat of battle. You want to go back? You would do the same thing. Don't go back. You don't want to go back. You would do the same exact thing. Some of you regret the fact that you raised your kids in orthodox religion. Let me ask you this. Did you do that in order to screw them? Did you sit in a dark corner with a cup of coffee and say, you know what, I'm really, how can I screw up my kids the worst? How, how can I make life more difficult for them? I know I'm going to take them to Catholic Church or I'm going to take them to the Baptist Church. No, none of you, zero percent of the people I'm talking to now ever thought that way. You did the best you could at the time under the circumstances and everything that your children went through via your hand via your influence as we all know and we camp on the sovereignty of god it was all absolutely necessary it was all meant to be. This is where the sovereignty of God comforts so much when you look back and it could not have happened any other way. I'm telling you. And there's no such thing as going back. It happened exactly as it was supposed to happen. Exactly. When you're in it, as I say, concerning the relative and the absolute viewpoint and the sovereignty of God, we, we live in the relative, but we believe in the absolute. We live at the time like it's all up to us. Knowing, though, knowing that in him we live and move and are. And God is operating in us to will and to work in accord with his delight. And however your kids were raised, that was in accord with God's delight. It was necessary. It may be that it provides the necessary contrast. Well, no, it not might be. It, it, this is the truth. It provides a necessary contrast for the deliverance no matter if your kids are believers now or not. Listen, I raised my kids the same. 
One's a religious believer, one's a worldly unbeliever, and one's a believer believer. So you never know. You never know what's going to happen to him after that. This was beyond my control. And so I want you to rest knowing that now that it's done, and even when it was going on, it was beyond your control. But you were hands-on. God bless you. Of course, we all are. We all live in the relative. We have to. But now I'm going to step back and give you the absolute truth that it, whatever happened had to happen. And even whatever happened to you when you were growing up with abusive parents, it had to happen that way. And it provides the contrast. It provided the contrast for you to enjoy the freedom and the love and the grace you feel with God right now. And it has to happen with your kids. It has to happen. However they were raised, whether they went through an, or an organized religion or you made mistakes, it had to happen in order to provide the contrast for their deliverance. Because just as you were delivered into the truth, they will be. If they're not now, they will be. And that's the comfort I have concerning my son Paul and my son Lou. I am totally at peace and I'm comforted by the fact that they had to go through what they went through. And it, it all provides a contrast for their future deliverance.